The following story contains scenes that may be disturbing to sensitive viewers. Now, where would we be without NGOs? They so often step in to do the things government either can't or won't. Providing vital care and other social services, they're often the last hope for society's most vulnerable. But their work requires funding, some of which they're able to raise themselves through donations. But few, if any, can survive without financial support from government, leaving them at the mercy of bureaucrats and budget cuts. In the Western Cape, one NGO provides a lifeline to the parents of children with severe disabilities. But when word arrived late last year that budgets were under pressure, Iris House, like many others, saw the writing on the wall. Here's Erin. I feel sometimes, hey, I wish I can die, man. Because I don't know what must I do. I don't know why I, why I leave. Because I think there's no hope, there's no light, there's just dark. Nolubalo Mbola is a mother of four. Her last two children were born with severe autism. I didn't know anything about autism. She was at a complete loss. The big one is very, very busy. Eat everything, even a chick, oh. domestos. All the stuff, the moisturizer, everything. I must be there all the time. And also my child is break the TV and also break everything. He can climb, all those stuff. Local creches and carers couldn't cope with her children. Her neighbors believed she was cursed. Forced to give up her job, she locked herself up in her home with her children. I don't want anyone to see my child. I don't want to go to the shop with him. I don't want to go anywhere with him. I was not coping. I didn't even sleep at night, and I'm asking, why God? Good, right? And if Oliver doesn't want you anymore, like I'm just showing you what we would then end up doing. Okay, over. Across town, Gillian Betterdorf is a single parent to 14-year-old Oliver. She lost her husband in a vehicle accident when he was just five years old. I was juggling things, you know, here and there, but now I've needed to do Oliver and the restaurant and our properties and not have any family. Life as a single mom raising a rapidly growing adolescent is tough. The emotional strain is huge as well because Oliver's epileptic seizures, they are under control with medication, but uh, it's always at the back of your mind. He could actually have a seizure during the night while you're sleeping. Once you work with these children, working any other type of, of career just doesn't do it. Sue van der Linde was a savior for both women. For the last 13 years, she has pioneered a community respite care model in South Africa. What is the philosophy behind the approach you have? Okay, well, we, we follow the, the UK children's hospice model. And the backbone of that is respite care. It's all about giving parents a break and giving children the opportunity to have the best quality life that they can. But years of hard work building a team able to offer parents life-saving support is at risk. Iris House and other non-profit organizations are on tenter hooks as looming budget cuts threaten their very survival. Just three months ago, they were warned by government that cost-cutting was on the horizon. It's thrown their lives into uncertainty. What then does the future hold for Iris House and other organizations and the desperate people they help? It's like a sword of Damocles hanging over our head right now. We have no idea what the end result's going to be. And that's scary. That's very scary. It's okay, will it? Children like 10-year-old Lise Lichle with severe cerebral palsy, unable to speak or see, need 24-hour care. 
The most challenging thing is that I have to sit at home and do the same job all the time, like change him his nappy, feed him, lift him up. Nolo Babalo Mayeyi was just 20, with dreams of a career and a social life when her son was born. I even have the time when I say I regret everything, like regrets come along when I'm alone sitting and thinking. But then I tell myself that he's here, then I just have to be strong for him. And I must forget everything else. Hi, Mutena. The physical and emotional demands of raising a child with disabilities are enormous. Parents take immense strain and sometimes just need a break. Awongiwe Mbola seems like an angel at the door. She's one of 35 community carers trained by Iris House Children's Hospice. Hi, Sissi. Hello, Sissi. I'm sorry. The right one, John. The right one, Yes. Papa, I come out of it. Papa, I can't tell you. I'm OK, you know. She will spend the next six hours caring for Lise Lise while his mother gets out of the house. And most importantly, it won't cost her a cent. The costs of raising a child living with disabilities are astronomical, which is exactly why Iris House has made sure that their care is free. I'm going to rest now. So, so, Amela, yeah, Pangela, Pangela, Sevenzini, she, yeah. Bye bye, viewers. Bye bye, boys. After years of isolation, Iris House rescued Nolo. Initially, they supported her by caring for her children. Soon, Nolo and her daughter trained as community caregivers, specializing in autism. Now they work full-time for Iris House. Iris House not only provides relief for parents at home, but also brings their children to the center for vital therapies they wouldn't typically have access to. And beyond the care, it's knowing somebody out there has their backs. The support network for these families trapped in the 24-hour cycle of intense care is a lifeline. I think what's most important is that uh, we're not alone. We have a sense of community, we have a sense of sharing, and one doesn't just generally get that in the public. So this has really been a catalyst to bring a lot of people together. Anytime I can phone Sue and say, oh, uh, stuck, help, I'm lost. Erin does have seizures, so you never know when it's just going to happen. Or she'll just suddenly stop breathing, and if anybody doesn't know her, it's a freak out. But the ladies are all well trained, and I know that she's in a very safe place. Unfortunately, our state-run schools, our state-run systems are totally overwhelmed. Our residential facilities, most of them are four to five year waiting list to get a child in. So the support is not there from the state. Provincial budgets have been slashed due to growing debt and global economic pressures. And despite the Western Cape being the third largest province in terms of population, it receives the fifth largest budget allocation from national government. The social development budget increased by 50 million rand. But when one takes into consideration firstly an over 7% wage increase and a 5% inflation increase, then we are actually, in real terms, going backwards by about 130 million rand. Dr. Robert MacDonald, head of social development in the Western Cape, says budget cuts have left them in dire straits, forcing them to freeze posts and cut back funding to NGOs. Because we already have staff employed and agreements compel us to increase those wages, and because we also have contracts with service providers that require us to honor those contracts and where inflation is built into the contracts. Your hands are tied. What happens is it squeezes out the money for NGOs. So, 
Iris House receives 40% of its budget from the Department of Social Development. Our model is completely elastic. It's wherever the community service is needed, we can get there, as long as there's carers to train. But the Department of Social Development has never kept up with that. So even if the, the cut is 100,000 off the budget, it's going to kill us. And it will kill far more than just Iris House. Natalie Johnson is the coordinator for the Western Cape Network on Disabilities, representing 92 organizations which reach over 84,500 people in the Western Cape. Let's talk about the survey that the network has done on uh, the potential impact. Well, we found that many of our members will be in trouble, us included. We're possibly going to have to shut our doors. I'm possibly not going to have a job from the 1st of April. And funders generally don't cover operational costs. They depend on the Department of Social Development to provide that funding. NPOs used to be classified as charity, whereas NPOs are not charities. We are doing the work of government. Government is mandated to serve the vulnerable. Western Cape Social Development funds over 1,000 NGOs and fear the 10% cut will destroy many of them and the resources built up over decades. For us, NGOs are a critical partner and integral part of our service delivery model. It means uh, a serious risk for the department's services overall and for the vulnerable people that we serve. We are faced with a number of NGOs that are on the brink of closure, old age homes, uh, homes for persons with disabilities, child and youth care centres, so it, it's a serious crisis. Are you angry? I'm furious. Iris House stands between our children and them being dumped in hospitals. Parents, they're already at the edge. Without our services, I'm really concerned that they will go over. And who's going to suffer at the end of the day? It's going to be the children. We are trying to protect the most crucial services, and we're trying to protect organisations from closing. Imagine what it would have been like if Iris House hadn't been there. Oh, I'm getting gold shivers. I, I really don't know how I would have gotten through, so I still fall back onto Iris House. I don't know if they're going to cope without Iris House because I visit the families, I saw what they need. They need Iris House a lot. While it is a crisis, Sue, Natalie and others refuse to give up. Thanks for watching. Why not drop us a comment below? We love reading your opinions. Remember, you can now access carte blanche stories anytime, anywhere, even offline. Carte Blanche, the podcast, is now available on all major podcast platforms. So be sure to hit that follow or subscribe button and be part of our growing online family.